I feel like the thing that Gen AI has done is showcase that try to resolve the challenge we've had for decades in terms of how people consume information. Um, so it's an accelerant from that respect. And now everybody's super excited about it, right? Because they can understand a chatbot. <laughs> so um, <laughs> they can't understand a dashboard, but they can understand a chatbot. Welcome back to the Data Bytes podcast, everyone. I am joined with the amazing Sandy Estrada. She is the vice president and analytics practice lead at Cervello. She has had numerous roles as a senior director, analytics client advisor, business development, and just has a really rich history in analytics and helping clients achieve success. So I'm super excited to be chatting with her today. Because in addition to her work at Cervello, she also leads our Boston chapter for women in data. So welcome to the Data Bytes podcast, Sandy. So you have been, I don't want to aid you and put a number out there, but you have been helping clients for quite some time, I would say like achieve their analytics dreams, right? So I was, I'm sure you've seen the gamut of the struggles, the triumphs, uh, but I know a big portion of what we're all trying to do is really democratize access to data, right? We know how powerful it is today. I think one of the good things about AI is it's shown more people to get into the conversation and be interested in it. But now it's like, wait, is our data ready for you to use it? So in your opinion, what are the essential co components of successfully democratizing data within an organization? Thank you, Sadie. So happy to be here. Yeah, thank you for that. I actually, you know, you know, funny thing that you brought up AI, and I feel like the thing that Gen AI has done is showcase that try to resolve the challenge we've had for decades in terms of how people consume information. Um, so it's an accelerant from that respect, and now everybody's super excited about it, right? Because they can understand a chatbot. <laughs> so um, <laughs> they can't understand a dashboard. <coughs> but they can understand a chatbot. Um, data democratization, I mean, to answer your question though, um, I, I think the I, I, funny thing is I, I really started my career there. I started my career trying to understand how or providing uh, ways for people to consume information, right? Um, that's really where I started uh, for, for the first decade of my career. And in that, there are a couple of key things that I found were critical. One is, defining what you mean by data democratization. Everyone has a different answer. Um, and making sure that every, the folks that you're trying to achieve that with um, have a description of what it is uh, that everyone can rally behind and be on the same page with. I think that organizations tend to have this, and I'm probably going to say this multiple times, ivory tower mentality of solutioning for the masses. Um, and the reality is you cannot have a single solution for every different type of persona, for every part of your organization and every layer of your organization. Democratization may mean different things for all the different parts of your company. Um, so that to me is critical. Uh, a critical component to getting it right is understanding who are you trying to uh, <laughs> support? How do they think about it? And how are they currently using data? And you know, where are they on their own data literacy journey within that group? Um, and once you have that, then it becomes things like upskilling, data literacy, data quality, data trust, all of those pieces uh, come behind it. But it always starts with getting on the same page. Yeah, you're the first person I've heard say one solution cannot fit everyone. And I think in technology, we really want there to be like one architecture, right? One tool, all of these things, you know, because we want to make it simple. We in technology are lazy. Let's be honest. That's why we create all these tools to automate things. We're the first ones to automate our own jobs. When you have to pick, you know, maybe a persona or really get focused on like, who are you democratizing data for first? How does the architecture play a role in this? And how do you create, you know, flexible solutions for your different audiences, but yet a strong key architecture? Because you can't have your foundation moving, you know, just like in a house, right? We can't have our foundation moving and shifting all the time. How do you balance those two? 
Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think there's layers to your architecture, right? There's fundamentally the need to bring data in within your organization or from outside your organization and ensure that it's consolidated and clear and, you know, it's a repeatable process. That's the first layer and that works for everybody, right? Because at the end of the day, you need all that information in house. Um, and I look at it in three tiers. So that's the first one. The second one I think about is the modeling of that information in a way that's consumable, right? And this is where it gets a little tricky for a lot of companies because I feel like organizations waste a lot of time building one model that suits many different needs across the organization. And I, I'm, I've always, from day one, and when I started my career in 1998, <laughs> um, I, I, to me, data modeling is core. You cannot have a lake. You can't just throw data out there and hope for the best. I, I truly believe that you need to have cleanly modeled data for consumption. So, and I never wavered from that. So it's kind of funny that nowadays people talk about it and I just like, this, this was passe. Did I miss the boat? Because we've always been doing this. Um, but my point here is um, ensuring that you understand how is that data going to be modeled for consumption and making that aligned to how it's going to be used um, for that core group, et cetera. Um, then the third layer is really how you're exposing that data from a consumption perspective, right? So, and it could, it could be multiple tools. You might have somebody wanting to do Excel. Somebody might want to be write a query. Somebody might want to have a dashboard. Somebody might want to have the semantic layer on the dashboarding system and do their own ad hoc analysis, right? There are so many different ways you might need to give it to a data scientist. There's many, many ways this data is going to be consumed. So you need to think about the, that technology stack also in terms of who is it, who is positioning it for that, that user persona and ensuring that it fits their needs. One of the things that comes up is when do I tap into consulting teams and kind of have that extra support? And when do we do this internally? And it looks like you've worked in both kind of industry and in consulting. I also did the same. I started in industry and then was like, I love what we did with the tr analytics transformation. I want to go and do that in consulting now and do it for more companies. But if you're in the industry side, how do you know like, yes, this is a good use case to tap into consultants and their knowledge or have that extra hands-on support versus, hey, this is something we really need to take on, do internally, build up the team to be able to make sure we can succeed. Right. And thanks for pointing out my, my background because I, I did spend a number of years in consulting, then went into industry, worked for two different financial services firms of different sizes, one massive organization, one smaller, and then went back into consulting. Um, and I'm glad I did that. It made me a better consultant. Um, I would say what I learned through that experience and what I keep seeing with my clients is that there are probably a few key questions you want to ask yourself if you're starting a new initiative or you, you know, if you're just starting a new initiative, <coughs> excuse me. The first one really is you want to ask yourself, do I have resources available to truly focus on this problem? That's the first question. And if the answer is yes, keep going. This is a whole decision tree for a moment. <laughs> the second question is, have they done this before and have they done it successfully? It, they may have done it before, maybe it wasn't a success. Um, but if you have a team of folks, one, two individuals maybe, to, for example, go gather requirements and they've never done it before or they've only done it once, maybe it didn't go well. If you're looking for an opportunity to not only get it right and accelerate that engagement, what I would suggest is you reach out to a partner that is not only willing to help you, but also willing to upskill your resource that is going to be fully dedicated to that engagement. That's a step that I think a lot of organizations miss when they interact with consultancies, including ours. They do not ask us or they do not provide a resource to be fully engaged at parts of the engagement. They wait to the end and say, okay, do the knowledge transfer now. And I always push for them to have folks on the team, primarily because it's a learning experience for them. And all the templates we have, our methodology, it's proven. We've been doing this for decades. <laughs> I'm happy to give it to them and have them use it internally. They never have to call us again. 
So that's the goal, right? Is leveraging that as an upskill opportunity for your team so that they have the best practices, frameworks, methodologies to be successful on their own in the future. Um, so that's my like two bit of this. That's when you should call them early, often, and make sure you have people available to make use of that capability in the future. Yeah, I think that's such a great call out to make sure you have people on your team who can be a part of the project the whole way through, not just of the hands off and knowledge transfer at the end. Because I think sometimes we think, okay, we're going to tap into consultants for like almost an extra staffy, right? And so it's not looked at as a partnership. And that doesn't work for many reasons, right? One, because say that then the communication channels fail and lots of problems happen. But looking at more as like, we're tapping into this extra knowledge to now transfer to our team, which is really the goal of any type of project. Um, So I love that really thinking of it as like a learning opportunity and there's no better way to learn from that hands-on experience with it as well. One of the things that unfortunately I see a lot of teams miss in their data projects is unfortunately measuring their ROI, which is quite funny, right? Because, you know, it's a little bit of like, guys, we have to drink our own champagne here, right? We talk about being data-driven, all of this. And then it's like that last bit of the project, wait, we forgot to track, like, what difference is this making? Can you provide some insights on how organizations can more effectively measure the ROI of their data projects? That's a great question. Um, First is defining them. I, I, I feel that a lot of these projects... Yeah, there's a there. There might be a um, efficiency gain or a lower cost in the future. Maybe you're migrating technologies, um, so on and so forth. But I, I feel that the misstep is clearly defining the the KPIs that you're going to go after during the project <laughs> or before you even launch the project and approve it, right? As you're getting the budget. Um, so the first step is defining it. The second to me is measuring where you are today. How long does it take to do X, Y, Z? How much time did, you know, how much revenue do you have coming from that channel that you're trying to increase or how much is your inventory turn and literally snapshotting it and setting it aside so that you have something to measure back to in the future when you're done with your project or as the project's ongoing. Um, I I would say those are the two key things and it sounds so basic, um, but a lot of organizations just do not do it. Um, I'm not going to sit here and give you platitudes about what are the right KPIs or ways, uh, you know, (laughs) to measure ROI, because the reality is you can come up with any measurement decision you want. Um, what matters, though, is even though you're getting that benefit, is it the right benefit and is it aligned with the strategy of the company? That's the other question. So I guess those three pieces. One, is it the right ROI to go after? Is it you know aligned to your strategy? Number two would be define it up front. <laughs> and number three, measure it up front so you have something to track back to in the future. Yeah, this is to me where like the whole point of data science, right? The word science really comes into play is, you know, when you come up with the hypothesis, the whole key is to create your success criteria beforehand, right? You know, like, okay, before we do this, otherwise it's cheating. If you create your success criteria afterwards, it's like, okay, well, anybody can create success criteria afterwards. But unfortunately, I don't see a lot of the, like, our actual data science roles in an organization doing that, right? Of like, hey, let's put the data scientist on the project that the data project that we're doing to measure and track our data project. Why is that? Is that like a lack of resources? Is it just something that's an afterthought? Why do, why do you think that happens? I wish I had an answer to that question. I actually do not know. I am sitting here going, why doesn't it happen? Uh, I think it's a combination of things. I think it's a lack of resources. I, I also think it's a lack of acumen. Um, Quite frankly, you know, the the maturity of a lot of organizations when it comes to measuring the success of any technology implementation is quite low. The bar is low right now. And I I think it's a matter of governance and acumen in terms of what the CIO and chief data officer wants to um, measure and how they want to measure it and showcase their success. So um, it it has to start from the top. And if if it's not required, people are not going to do it. Yeah, you bring up a great point in regards to acumen because 
this is such a struggle with so many technical teams is just even getting the business acumen and kind of vice versa, right? We always have like that translation barrier between the technical teams and the business teams. What have you seen work to better provide that knowledge transfer between business teams and technical teams? You know, today we have these amazing duels that have gone and sweeped the internet and have this wealth of knowledge, and yet we still have trouble communicating between technical and business teams. It's like, okay, sometimes we got to solve some of these, you know, core base one problems. How do we start to increase that collaboration and more so knowledge transfer between those two teams? Yeah. Um, I find it interesting that you call it knowledge transfer. Because <laughs> um, to me, it's I'm not looking to transfer knowledge. I'm looking to ensure that everyone's speaking the same language or at least are meeting each other where they are, right? So um, and the only way to solve for that is to truly have those team members get in a room and have real conversations and solution together. Um, granted, a business person is not going to sit there and watch your data engineer do work, but when you're talking about what are the requirements, what is this going to look like day to day? What is the business process going to look like in the future? Um, what is the technology, you know, data flow? You don't even have to get to the architecture, but even just the flow of how things are going to work, <laughs> you know, like day to day, week to week, month to month, um, and having that conversation together and figuring that out together in the room helps create trust. It helps create understanding and communication. And I think oftentimes these conversations happen in isolation, and then people come together and give status reports, and then they walk away assuming that everybody's on the same page. Um, so to me, that's the number one key. And the funny thing about being a consultant, and I, I didn't have an appreciation for this until I worked in a, an organization whose job, like the, the team I was in originally in industry, sat between the business and IT. We were kind of the first version of a product, a product team uh, at, at the financial services organization I worked in. So as a product team, we owned all the requirements. We owned all the, you know, the program management of it. Etc. And that's when I first realized, whoa, wait a minute, companies don't do this. This is what consultants do. They come in and they make everybody get in a room and have these conversations. So I, so it was something I implemented day one. I ensured that our teams were collaborating, sitting in the room, having these conversations. And trust me, nobody liked it. Everyone was upset. Everyone thought it was a waste of time. But at the end, after three, four months of us designing and coming together, a project that was already five years late when I started working there actually got done <laughs> because we all had the same vision. We all understood the language. We all were on the same page. And you can't do that by giving each other status reports. You have to really do the hard work in the room. Now, I'm curious, have you noticed a difference of having these conversations in person or virtual, right? Because I think that's a big debate even kind of right now, of like uh, more of leadership's like, you guys need to come back to work. It makes a difference. 100% agree. We got to get people into the same room. I'm going to use air quotes for those who are listening here right now to, t to chat. But have you noticed of like a difference between getting into the same quote unquote room, a virtual room versus a physical room. Does that make a difference in getting to that shared vision and goals faster? Yeah, um, it does. And I'll tell you why. Because I, it shouldn't. On the face of it, it absolutely should not. However, there are a few things you miss virtually. One is everyone's multitasking today. Everyone. Um, we're not doing it right now because we're recording a podcast or an active conversation. But if you're in a meeting, I would say 75% of the people on that call are multitasking. And if you're multitasking, you're not getting the information. Um, you're not actively engaged. That's the biggest challenge I think we have in this virtual world. And that's why people are pushing to have everyone in the same building, et cetera. Um, I think the second piece really to me is it, it's hard to build trust if you've never met the person in person, it, it is actually really hard to understand, you know, how are they receiving what I'm telling them virtually? If I don't know who you are, it's hard for me to read your, it really actually is hard for me to read you on a screen versus having met you kind of get an understanding of your body language in person. It, it translates a little better the second time around. There's probably some psychology behind that or, you know, human 
it's just regular interaction that we've all, you know, decades and decades and thousands and millions of years of, 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 uh, uh, being a human has, has provided evolution. That's the word I was looking for has provided to us. Um, but I, I think those two pieces are, are the, the challenge that we have to face and, and understand. I have seen it even in our own teams. I have clients that are, they themselves are virtual and we will offer our office for them to come to us, spend just two or three days a quarter, um, laying out what we're going to do over the next quarter with them. And, it helps significantly just ensure we're on the same page. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. Is it's a condition of our biology, right? Of like you mentioned, years of evolution of like gathering in tribes that, you know, what have we been in this virtual world for four years now, I think, or so? You know, I don't think we're gonna evolve that quick. Unfortunately, our biological systems don't evolve that quick. Um, but it does make a difference, you know, for, for, I'm sorry, unfortunately for all of those, like, I want to work from home forever. It's like, well, we may need you to come in for a meeting or two. <laughs> yeah. I do worry about the younger generation. I, you're not going to network within your organization. You're not going to network outside your organization if you're home all day. Um, that's one, one thing people say, oh, it doesn't matter. But I will tell you that I would not be at the firm I'm at if I did not have my network. And I wouldn't be in the role I'm at if I did not have my network. And the only way to build that is to get outside your house. A hundred percent. And I think that, you know, I look at the same. I was like, I don't know how I would have even got to where I am in my career today if I didn't first, you know, have that first job where I was able to connect with so many people, learn from so many people, you know, sit next to senior engineers and data modelers and look at their screen and even just say, what are you doing? What are you working on? Like, tell me about that. I mean, there's so much information that just, I feel like gets transferred in those small moments, right? And even the body language of like, how do you carry yourself in a meeting? How do you greet random people that come up to you? It seems silly, but these are all the things that make a big difference. And particularly if you want to move up in your career, it's uh, less about your IQ and more about your EQ, right? And so being able to get that information is, is really key. So I'm curious to learn a little bit more about your story. Was there a point in your career that you felt was just a significant turning point for you? Uh, maybe a challenge you faced or an aha moment? And, and what did you learn from that and how did you overcome it? Yeah, I get asked this a lot. And I, I definitely have many pivotal moments, I, I think, in my career. I but the one just yesterday I was at an event and I, I had a huge aha moment about the last couple of years of, of, of me as an individual. I have transformed into somebody who's finally confident with my voice and I'm an executive. I report to the CEO of our firm. I have a very large team. I right, like I there's a whole list of things that I could talk about in terms of what I've accomplished in my career, but yet I have have had this problem in the past where I felt that I, you know, my knowledge wasn't really worth talking about, right? Or having these types of conversations, I had nothing to bring, um, et cetera. And over the last two years, I really had forced myself to get uncomfortable and to have these conversations and put my voice out there and just be active. And it, yesterday I walked around, networked with 60 people, CEOs, board members. I was in this interesting environment and for the first time in my life, I was extremely confident in who I, in being me. And I think that my point to this is that if you're uncomfortable with something, focus on that, practice at it. It's going to be ugly for a year or two, maybe, <laughs> maybe even six months, but do it. You know, if you don't network, if you're, you're, you feel weird coming up and talking to people, try things out because it's not a failure. It's always a learning experience. And I, I think that a lot of people shy away from being uncomfortable and really want to stay in their comfort zone, you know, and, or they don't believe they belong in those rooms when in reality they do, they just haven't tried it yet. Um, so that's something that I, I keep saying to others, but for the first time in my life, I truly believe it. <laughs> I can a hundred percent agree with you. I, in February this year, I distinctly remember coming from an event and I had shared my story and had this, I was driving home and I was like, it feels good to be me. And it was like this aha moment of like, oh my goodness, like, is this the first time you felt that way, CD? <laughs> right? Like, wait. Yeah. And I think it's important to share that with people too, right? Because like, you know, reading your LinkedIn, I will look at 
what you do and say, oh my goodness, this person is extremely confident and, you know, speaks flawlessly and can lead and do all these things and you do them, right? But knowing what's on the inside of someone, I think is also so important and that we all have some place that's an edge for us to go, right? An edge of like, this is an uncomfortable space and I'm going to continue to push forward. And I'm sure both you and I are going to find our new edge now that we got this newfound confidence, right? And we're going to have to dive in and, and be messy and feel uncomfortable, but it's worth it. Like every time it's so worth it because that's how we continue to grow. So that's great advice. In regards to aspiring young professionals, you know, what advice would you give them beyond diving into that area that's uncomfortable, networking? If you look back in your career, is there one thing you wish you would have maybe spent some more time on or just wish you knew what you know now? Yeah, I, I think one of the things earlier in my career, I actually remember a conversation I had with, it was probably four years into my career, I was leaving a meeting with our CEO and I just so happened to be in a meeting with him with a client. And I remember asking him, I can't wait till I'm at a point where I can speak up and ask questions at a meeting. And he looked at me deadpan and said, why don't you? you <laughs> why do you wait until we leave the room and then you're bombarding me with all these questions? You, you have good questions. And by the way, the client should be answering those questions, not I. Um, and it, it was, it was definitely an interesting moment. It took me probably a year and a half before I got comfortable, uh, doing that in client, uh, meetings. And I kind of had to throw myself in that situation, but I wish I had done it sooner. I wish I, I had just asked questions, uh, spoken up, uh, stated my mind, even if it was before or after, um, or enduring at a much, much earlier age. I, I feel that a lot of the challenges I had in finding my voice and, you know, making an impact uh, early in my career could have been accelerated. So I think, uh, uh, you know, if you're young and you're <laughs> concerned that you're going to ask a question that everyone else knows the answer to, well, guess what? They may not have the answer and you might be looking at something very insightful that they haven't thought about. So always ask the questions because what is not obvious, <laughs> you might not be obvious to you may not be obvious at all to the people you're asking that question of um, because they've been doing it for so long. Uh, sometimes that outside non-knowledgeable perspective brings a lot of insight to the people who have been doing that work forever. Um, so I just, I just wish I had done that sooner. Last year, you won mentor of the year for women in data, um, along with another couple of other awards, a data leader as well. What advice would you give to individuals who want to be a great mentor. And also I think what's also important is how to be a great mentee. Great question. Um, let's start with the mentee side of this because being a great mentee shows you how to be a great mentor. I feel like it's, uh, you have to start there. Um, I still get mentoring from peers. I still get mentoring from others outside my organization. Um, and when I do that, I, I think the thing that I learned quickly is they're there for me, right? Um, therefore, I need to bring them where I need the help. I need to tell them, this is kind of what, why I'm using your time. Here are the areas of focus I need from you. Here's kind of what I'm thinking. They're there to give you advice. They're not there to tell you what to do. Um, so <coughs> keeping that in mind and, and focusing those conversations in that respect helps create a very good relationship with your mentor and guides your mentor in terms of where they can give you support. So that's key one. And being a great mentor is making sure you realize you're not there to tell people what to do. <laughs> you're there to l let them figure that out, right? So give them advice, share your experiences in terms of how you handle those things. Um, and, and they're receiving it much better when you do it that way, right? Um, here's kind of what worked for me. Maybe you should try it. Have you thought of that, right? Not maybe you should try it, but have you thought of that? And I, I think that's a, a different perspective. Um, and just being there to support that individual and giving them your focus. If you're going to be a mentor, you really need to focus on that individual when you're with them um, and listen to the spaces in between. Uh, sometimes mentees don't tell you everything um, because they're, you know, ashamed, embarrassed, et cetera, whatever it may be. Uh, so follow up questions uh, always help in giving that advice and guidance as well. Yeah, that's great advice. I think I know some of my first mentorship opportunity, I was definitely looking for 
just tell me what to do, right? <laughs> Very, like, I just, I don't want to figure it out, Throw kind of throwing up your hands and you no, know, and I was lucky enough to have good mentors, which were like, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'll give you some advice on your problems. So that's some great advice. I know recently both of us were really saddened by the news of women who code shutting down. And, you know, it's one of those, particularly for anyone who works in this space and advocates for these things, it's always sad to see organizations like that take it, can make you feel like we're almost taking a step back in this space, right? And it's like, if anything, we need to double down and making progress in it. What advice do you have for organizations and individuals are like, how do we actually start to see the needle be moved more uh, within diversity and equity in tech careers? Yeah, I, I think that's a challenging question to answer um, for multiple reasons. But I, I do find there, there are a few, depending where you are within the organization, there are a few things you can do. One is provide a safe space for that group, right? Whether it's women whether it's the LGBTQ community, whether it's uh, neurodiversity, right? Create a safe space for that group to um, just collaborate, network, get to know each other. So you can find other individuals that maybe are struggling the way you're struggling. Um, and don't minimize that because I, I think sometimes it's minimized um, in, in terms of how we think maybe slightly different <laughs> and, and how, what we're dealing with might be slightly different and others may not have an appreciation for that. So um, that's the first piece. Well, depending on where you're sitting in the company, you can create that space. And sometimes it can be a ground cell. If your organization doesn't have it, reach out to other women and create it. You don't have to get approval, right? Um, that's, that's one piece. The second is if you're a hiring manager, make a point, <laughs> make a point to tell your team, I need to see, you know, a, for every male resume, I'll give you an example for 10 male resumes. I want to see 10 female resumes. I don't care how bad they are. I just want to see it um, and force the conversation. I think oftentimes we hope and pray people are doing the right thing. Um, but I, 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 I trust, but validate is what I tell everybody. I want to trust you, but I'm going to validate that you're doing the right thing by making you do certain things in my, in return. So that's just something, a little trick that has worked for us. We found a lot of, we actually have a plethora of women leaders now at our firm. Um, and that was me literally telling our recruiting team, I don't want to see just men. Please make sure you have some diversity in here. And if you do give me men, make that diverse as well. Um, and they've done a really incredible job and we found some incredible leaders that way. That's amazing. Well, I just want to say a big thank you for all the work that you're doing in this space. And most importantly, just the work you're doing on yourself and for yourself and showing up every day and being a leader within the data community. Um, we're really grateful to have you in this space. So thank you for taking the time and coming and sharing with us today. Happy to be here. And Sadie, honestly, thank you so much for what you're doing for women in data the community you're building, um, it's exceptional. And I'm just so happy to be part of it and be able to help you out. My pleasure. And a big thank you to our listeners. I mean, Sandy and I would, would just be here having a conversation if it wasn't for you listening and a great conversation. So remember to stay curious and keep learning. And we'll catch you next time on the Data Bytes podcast. Bye-bye, everybody. If you are enjoying the conversations you are hearing today, we encourage you to continue to be a part of the conversation and join a community of like-minded, extraordinary women. With our free community membership, you're stepping into a realm where learning, networking, and growth are at the heart and soul of what we do. Connect with Women in Data's global community and network with our chapters all for free. But why stop there? Upgrade your membership with a special offer for Databytes listeners by getting $20 off a pro membership in which you'll receive access to over 300 classes, leadership training, and exclusive events. If you're interested in mentorship and networking, we've got you. From monthly thought leadership webinars to exclusive networking events and a diverse on-demand mentorship program, the connections you'll make here are boundless. Join us and be part of a vibrant network. Dive into our book clubs, growth groups, and industry-focused gatherings. Women in Data is not just a community. It's a movement, a place where innovators, changemakers, and leaders come together to shape the future. 
visit womenindata.org to join or use the special discount code in the show notes. Together, let's drive change one data byte at a time.